So today we are talking about that big question, what exactly am I supposed to be teaching? So if you have ever struggled with, I have my standards, but I'm not really sure what content I'm supposed to be teaching. It doesn't seem like there's enough or, oh my gosh, it seems like there's too much. What am I teaching? This video is for you. Okay, so I'm Nicole Van Tassel, creator of iExplore Science uh, and founder of iExplore Academy. That's our professional development program for teachers who are transitioning to three-dimensional instruction uh, and the NGSS. And thanks for being a part of this group. So what exactly am I teaching? This is a um, question that I have to ask myself, honestly, every time I'm, I am planning a new NGSS unit. I... You know, I've taken, obviously, these science courses before, whether it's a, familiar, a topic that's familiar to me or something I might learn again, need to learn again. But you have to know your content, like, so much more than your students know it. So there's always that question of, okay, wait, what exactly do I need to know? What do my students need to know? In the past, we would have approached this question by doing what we've always done. I always taught these 20 vocabulary words, so these are the 20 vocabulary words and concepts I'm going to teach again. I've always taught these um, these elements or these concepts, or um, I've always taught it in this way. I've always done these labs. We are not doing that anymore. We are moving away from that approach. In the past, we would have um, followed a textbook. We would rely on a textbook to tell us what we are supposed to teach. We are moving away from that. And in the past, we would focus on this like inch deep, mile wide. Let's cover every little fact we can about this topic, but we're only going to go an inch deep because, hey, time, you have to sacrifice something. So we're going to cover all the content, but only a little bit. And that's doing our students a disservice. And that's why the NGSS has moved away from that. And instead, we're focusing on big ideas, the facts and information and details that support those big ideas, but you don't have to have all of the facts and big ideas. So what are we doing instead? Instead, we're focusing on those big ideas, the disciplinary core ideas. We are focusing on phenomena. So we're going to be choosing our content. Um, we're going to be, well, it's like a, it's kind of like a chicken and egg thing. It's like a cycle of, of navigating this like process of disciplinary core ideas, finding a phenomena, tying the core ideas and the details back to the phenomena, and then the evidence statements. And we're really going to be talking about evidence statements in this um, workshop right now, or this little training here. So your disciplinary core ideas are going to help you choose your phenomena. Those are your big ideas that your students need to know. That is really the science concepts we want our students to understand. And you are going to use those to pick your big phenomena that you, phenomenon that your students um, are going to use to understand those core ideas. The details are going to be tied to the phenomenon. The evidence statements are going to help you identify some of those details. And that, in turn, is going to help you refine the phenomenon you've chosen. It's going to help you figure out on a more lesson level um, those objectives. And so that's why I said it's kind of like a, a, a loop. You look at your disciplinary core ideas. You start coming up with ideas for phenomena. You look at your evidence statements. You come back and you refine your you refine the phenomena you, you, that you're gonna you're gonna focus on, um, and and you just kind of go through this process of refining until you have something that matches. Um, but right now we're gonna look at the evidence statements and how we can break down those evidence statements and use them to help us clarify concepts. So to understand really what the standards are talking about, because sometimes it's a little confusing. I will admit. Uh, how we can use them to identify phenomena. Again, because our units are, are crafted around phenomena and the phenomena that we choose really has a huge impact on the content that we're teaching. So that's why we obviously want to choose, choose good phenomena because we want it to be relevant to the content that we need to or want to teach. Um, and then we can use these evidence statements to craft actual assessments as well. Okay, so I'm going to model breaking down an evidence statement. This is what I do before I dive into any sort of unit planning. I need to make sure that I fully understand like the performance expectation and all the components of it. Now, the evidence statement is not like the end all be all. It's not you can't um it's not that you can't go outside of the evidence statement, but I like to have guidance and it helps 
um, give me some structure when I'm starting out. And it helps me make sure I'm not like missing things or going like totally off base. So this is always where I start, just so I really understand what the performance expectations are asking for um, and what things I might include in my unit. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip the screen and I'm gonna share with you my screen and how I'm gonna break down this evidence statement. Okay, I'm gonna just flip it, hold on one second. Okay, so this is the evidence statement for MSESS 2-6, and this is the standard that relates to, or the performance expectation that relates to climate. So this is a, down here is a document that I created to help me um, break down my evidence statements for a unit and put them all in one place. Uh, there's a process that I go through after I do this that I, helps me in the storylining process where I actually break. Um, you can see that I have, this is one performance expectation, but in one bundle or in one unit, I'm going to cover several performance expectations, maybe not five, maybe two, three, four. Um, but uh, I break them apart into different parts of the storyline. So it's not just here's PE1, then PE2, then PE3. But anyway, that's a different topic that's storylining. Um, but I wanted them all to be in one place so I could see them and I like to do it on the computer. So I created this document. Okay, so the first thing I do is just copy and paste it. I copied it into here so that I don't have to be like going back to the evidence statements all over the place and have papers everywhere. I can go back and I can see exactly what my performance expectation is. I also copy in the disciplinary core ideas because these are the big ideas that I want my students to understand. And they're going to help, um, again, just I have it all in one place. I use during the storylining process all of that. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually create my some of my objectives. And some of this is just a way of taking notes for myself so that when I'm doing my lesson planning, when I'm crafting my assessments, when I'm choosing my phenomena, I'm making sure to, to highlight these parts. Originally, I used to kind of break down these, per, these evidence statements just by writing notes, kind of annotating right on this. And I would find that every single time I went back to the evidence statement, I would, I would see different things that I missed. Or I honestly sometimes didn't understand my notes because I was writing them in the margins. So creating this document was a way to help myself. Um, but, but, but basically, an ev the evidence statement, and I'll show you this. Let me expand it. The evidence statement has these different components, and a lot of times people read this and there's repetition in there. Uh, so part of the reason that I want to break it down is I want to get rid of some of the repetition because seeing it again and again, and I just want to like condense it into a way that makes sense to me. I want to rephrase it in a way that makes sense to me. It's almost like if any of you have any sort of ELA background, close reading, um, that's a strategy we use in English language arts where you interact with the text to make sure you really understand what it's saying instead of just like breezing through it. It's a good strategy to use in literacy in your science classes. And it's basically what I'm doing with this evidence statement here. Um, but part of this is super simple. Like you can see, I just broke down. Okay, so students create a model to make sense of a phenomenon. That's the first sense, the first part of to make sense of a phenomenon, they develop a model. I am, again, I'm just trying to put it in just very simple terms that I can see really quick, read really quick, you know, it's broken down with inputs and outputs. So I just model includes inputs and outputs. And now here's my list of things that the model is going to include. This is going to be helpful when I create my performance tasks. And it might not be this performance expectation might not just be one task, there might be several activities throughout the unit, where different elements of this come into play. Um, because as you'll see, there's a lot that goes into this standard and maybe it's going to be a lot for students to, I mean, if you look at like landforms, mountains, deflecting wind, and then also tying in maybe like latitude, that might be, um, a, it might be hard to find a specific region or specific location that the students can, can view both mountain, the impact of mountains and the impact of latitude. Those might be two separate phenomena. So maybe there's two different models here that students are going to be using or developing. So this doesn't have to be, this performance expectation doesn't have to be assessed in one single test or one single assessment. Um, but all of the models, or at least some, the models at some point, they must all, all of the models combined 
must address these components. So there must at least be some model that includes the rotating earth. There must at least be some model that includes like the ocean and continents and landforms and ice. And obviously we don't want our model to only be rotating earth and only be ocean. We want our students to see the relationships between these elements, but there might not, but the model might not have all of these. That's not to say it won't, it's possible you could do it, I'm just saying you don't have to feel like I need to put every single thing on this evidence statement into one assessment because that might be challenging to do. It is okay to break this into more than one task. A performance expectation, and this is kind of diverging into assessments, but a performance expectation and all these evidence statements and all of that, this is developed so that students are doing this by the end of the grade band. So it doesn't have to be by the end of your unit even. It for sure does not have to be on a single one assessment, one, you know, task, just so you know. Okay, so there's my list of things that I have broken down here. It is broken here, but I just wanted to make it even simpler. And it's my checklist here. Again, my goal is I'm putting it all in one document so I don't have 12 different evidence statements I'm browsing through every time I'm trying to plan my unit. Um, I also... Okay, so then that part was pretty simple and straightforward. Here's where it's going to get a little bit more, um, this is where, okay, so that was helpful with the assessment task. Now we're getting into teaching. How is this, how is the evidence statement going to help my actual instruction? So here's an example of students I, in the model, students are identifying and describing relationships. So these are the understandings we want students to, to walk away with. These are some of the, um, the higher level thinking type things. Um, and this is where, again, your, con your content is coming in. So students identify relationships between components. That's like my heading here. These are the relationships I want my students to see. So for example, how distribution of solar energy affects temperature. I just wanted to rephrase this part here. It made sense to me to just rephrase it as how distribution of solar energy affects temperature. And I might use something along those lines in wording in my actual objectives with my students too. Higher latitudes re receive less solar energy, yada, yada. That's really long. I just simplified it as high latitude versus low latitude in the solar energy per unit area. This is giving me an idea of this is one like lesson or one activity, one exploration we're going to have to do because students are going to have to figure out how latitude affects the solar energy per unit area and how that then affects temperature. Smaller temperature changes in the ocean. This is another exploration we're going to have to do. Um, in general, areas at higher elevations. So the impact of elevation on the distribution of solar energy and temperature changes. So you can see I'm just kind of simplifying what's in here so that I've, I'm, I'm identifying the content I'm teaching. I'm going to be teaching about latitude and the solar energy um, input. I'm going to be teaching about the temperature changes in the ocean versus land and as an extension of that, why that happens. So that kind of ties into up here, the thermal energy transfer of water. So I might add thermal energy transfer water versus land. Um, so I continue it on in that fashion. And then here's the connections. So this is where I students are, and I might make another. So students to use the model to tie to the phenomenon, because that's really what connections are doing. Um, so my students should be tying to the phenomenon. And again, this might be multiple different phenomena because this might be multiple different assessment tasks. They should be explaining a pattern in latitudes to explain pattern in temperature differences across different latitudes. Um, and I, that's not worded well, but you know what I mean. Um, explain pattern, explain why the equator is wetter than, um, the like 30 degree areas or why deserts are 
around 30 degrees. And that, here's a phenomenon right now, okay? So now we're looking at rainfall, and this could be a phenomenon looking at a map of where all the deserts in, on Earth are located, and a lot of them are on this 30 degree band, and they can explain this pattern of air moisture rising and sinking and all of that, and that has to do with um, the, the cells and atmospheric circulation and all of that. So you can see that by breaking this down, I'm identifying the content that I'm going to be teaching. I'm identifying, it doesn't say I'm going to be teaching them like the Hadley cell and, um, and uh, why the equator is wetter, but I can kind of infer that from this pattern of drier and wetter climates and that's going to help me choose my phenomenon. And in my unit for this climate unit, my focus actually is on deserts. And we use deserts as like the lens to, and there's deserts is like the broad topic, but there's obviously specific phenomena within that, specific deserts and specific instances of, of rain in the desert and specific, um, you know, temperature data and all of that to understand climate and um, global climate and where deserts are found and all that stuff. So you can see that by breaking it down, I by breaking down my evidence statement, I am one, able to figure out things like my assessment task, like these are the things I wanna make sure I'm seeing in my students' models. I can identify like the actual content elements I'm going to teach, like I need to teach the impact of latitude, I need to in teach the impact of like the thermal energy transfer in water versus land. I need to teach the impact of elevation and features of our surfaces like mountains and being near coasts and um, those, those aspects. I need to teach the motion of ocean waters and air masses, salinity, temperature, high density to low density. And then I need to, it can help me also refine and choose, like choose and refine my phenomena because I can um, use these examples to kind of spark spark phenomena choices like why is the equator wetter um, so maybe I'm gonna look at rainforests and where they're found or why are deserts found at this specific area and I'm gonna look at specific desert environments and, and that data or that's those maps or things like that um, some other examples here um, higher altitudes maybe I'm gonna think of a, a specific mountain um, edges of land masses and marine climates. Maybe I can think of a specific um, city or region that I'm interested in that has a marine climate that my students could be interested in. All of these these evidence statements. So when I started this unit and I'm thinking of climate, I mean, that's just a big like, oh, climate, okay. But when I look at the evidence statement, I can start thinking of all of these more specific examples that help me figure out both the assessment task and um, and the phenom and, and the actual content I'm going to teach, and then the phenomena I'm going to use to to help students understand those those concepts and help students see those concepts at work in the real world and discover those concepts, and then actually prove to me that they've learned those concepts by applying it back to phenomena. Um, I hope this was a little bit helpful in breaking down the evidence statements. I hope you understand why it's valuable to do this to to break down these evidence statements. These are really valuable resources that we have. Um, I, again, you don't have to necessarily be limited by this evidence statement. You don't have to, uh, you can kind of see, I'm gonna, um, you, you don't have to be limited by the evidence statement necessarily, but you can use it to kind of inform your understanding of what the performance expectation is asking. Um, and what it's talking about and it's just a it's just a really nice resource if you're going into a unit and you're like I'm not really sure what to teach I'm not sure what phenomena to go with I just don't know what this what this standard is about I know I'm supposed to teach this standard I just don't know more than that I always start with my evidence statements even if I think I know what I'm supposed to teach I always start with my evidence statements um, and it really helps me map out where I want my unit to go it's the first step that I always take when I'm about to storyline a unit. All right, so I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions about evidence statements or breaking them down or anything like that, please just reach out. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great one.